Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Ava Rose, also known as The Religious Hippie. You can basically follow me on any social media platform or you can go straight to my website at thereligioushippie.com. So today I have a special guest with us. We have Father Ambrose. He's a Norbertine from uh, California. That's where you guys are based. Um, so I'm really excited because today we're going to talk about angels. Yes, thanks be to God. I love to speak about angels, Dan. Me too. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. I, I think that this is a really important topic today because with the doom and gloom of everything going on these days, I feel like focusing on the positives and the most, you know, beautiful creatures, honestly, are the angels and how they protect us and just going over St. Michael specifically because there's something coming up with St. Michael, correct for you guys? Correct. So our monastery in Southern California is St. Michael's Abbey mm -hmm. under the patronage of the glorious uh, Prince of the Heavenly Host, St. Michael the Archangel. We're a large Norbertine Abbey. We come from a very ancient monastery, which was in Hungary, also the Abbey of St. Michael. Uh, Chorna, Hungary, founded in 1180 oh, wow. as our mother abbey. So the patronage of St. Michael goes all the way back 800 years and more, and he's been protecting our community for, for many centuries. So we're looking ahead now at the end of the summer here to St. Michael's Day. St. Michael and all the archangels, we celebrate that on September 29th, mm. also known as Michaelmas, yes. so the, the, the Peace of St. Michael. And this year at our Abbey, we're really leaning into the protection of St. Michael in this pivotal presidential election year. It's a, a, a crazy time in the world with wars going on around the world. Yes. We, we feel like we in the church need especially to rely on the assistance of the Holy Angels, and especially St. Michael the Archangel, in these critical times. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that we can be really confident that God is taking care of us if we turn to the angelic help that he gives us. So St. Michael's Day is the end of September. St. Michael's Abbey is going to be launching on all of our social media, and especially our Abbot Circle Virtual Monastery, a novena, a special solemn novena in preparation for St. Michael's Day. That's amazing. So everybody should look forward to that and find out about that on on yes. stmichaelsabbey.com, theabbotcircle.com. I'll link it below. Yes. <laughs> Instagram, YouTube, all, all the places. Wonderful. Because I think it's really important these days, especially to know that we have angels watching over us. Our guardian angels, St. Michael, St. Raphael, St. Gabriel, you know, and I think knowing more about the angels is really going to help people connect with them better. Yes. And I think especially today, people are really into that type of thing. We were kind of talking about that earlier. Um, and they're just really into that side of falsism and spiritual side and understanding it. So I think this is going to be a great conversation. Do you, um, what is your own personal relationship with your guardian angel and what are our guardian angels relationship to us? It's a great question about the guardian angels, Amber. Maybe before we dive into the, the guardian angels, let's back up just for a second about angels in general, because a lot of people here, you know, we, we talk about angels that people don't really know what they are necessarily. Yes. Would you agree? Yeah, I would definitely agree. So the angels are pure spirits. You know, the word angel means what they do. St. Gregory the Great famously uh, says, when we talk about angels, we're not talking about who they are. We're talking about what they do. Mm. Angel means messenger. That Greek that Greek word means messenger. So they're conveying messages from God. That's what angels do. But what are they in their nature? Angels are pure spirits. They don't have bodies. Right. We human creatures are bodies and souls together, composite beings. Angels are pure spirits. Okay, so when God created everything outside of the Holy Trinity, which existed from all eternity, he first created the angelic order before he created the sun and the moon and the stars and the universe, the, the visible, tangible, material universe. So the angels are God's creatures. They are perfect intellects. They're, they're like humans in that they have a reason and a will, an intellect and a will but their intellect is perfect and their will is perfectly fixed on whatever they choose at the beginning of their existence. Okay. So that's a little short course in angelology. <laughs> we but love that. <laughs> angels. And, and guardian angels are the, the kind of the, the, where this angelic order meets the human order. Where right. The, it's the frontier between us human beings as creatures of God and the angelic order. Uh, they are, of the nine choirs of angels, the guardian angels are at the very bottom <laughs> of all of those choirs because their their job is to take care of us and to help us to get to heaven, help us to avoid the dangers of sin, especially the dangers of sin 
and, and also physical danger. So guardian angels are these beautiful, consoling uh, creatures. It's, it's part of our Catholic faith. Uh, first of all, the existence of the angels are a dogma of our faith. It's something that we must believe in because they're all over the scriptures, all mm-hmm. over the Old Testament. We we hear about angels. We read about angels. An angel consoled our Lord in his agony in the garden. Yeah. Wasn't that um, said to be St. Michael? St. Gabriel. Saint is Gabriel. That, by a pious tradition is that that was St. Gabriel, That's the right. same archangel who came and announced the, the incarnation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The, the archangel Gabriel has these wonderful special jobs, especially associated with the incarnate word of God, Jesus Christ, our savior. So uh, we know that angels exist. Our Lord even says himself in St. Matthew's gospel that we should never scandalize the little children of God because their angels look upon the face of their heavenly father. Mm -hmm. So we know even from the words of Jesus himself in the New Testament that guardian angels exist, they're protecting us. Each of us has one who is assigned to us at our birth by God to every human being. Catholic or Christian or not, every human being is given a, a, an angel to protect it in life and especially to bring it to salvation. So um, we we can rely on these creatures who do nothing. Each of us has his or her own angel who is continually looking at the palm of the face of God, praying for us in heaven, and at the same time assisting us here on earth. It's so beautiful. It's so consoling. Yeah. We don't we forget that they exist. Yeah, I know a lot of people who, when I talk to them about guardian angels, and I'm like, cultivate a relationship with your guardian angel. And they're like, what? They're like, like, how do I do that? And I'm just like, if you ask them for help, you're, you know, because you can ask them every time I get to my car, I always ask for, you know, protection because cars are dangerous. Yes, very dangerous. And even though we have a giant truck, it still doesn't mean that things are, you know, okay if you get into an accident. Um, And for me personally, like my guardian angel, has saved me multiple times from like things I can't even explain mm-hmm. to situations where I specifically asked for help and they were able to help me. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is a a gift, obviously, from God that so many people do not take advantage of. Absolutely. Yeah. And even more, I mean, all of those physical protections are important because we we can't become saints of God if we die yeah. unexpectedly, right? So they protect us in that way in physical ways, but but even more so, they can be involved in our relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, angels, um, along with the demons, they they have a kind of access to the parts of our interior mental life that are bound to matter. So our memory, our imagination, not our will. They can never manipulate our will. But you know, with the ways that we're tempted, for example, in our imagination, that's all cooperated and assisted by the work of demons, fallen angels. Right. The way that we're consoled, made to think about or encouraged to think about holy things or virtuous things that's assisted by the angels. But you think, well, what if you're in a relationship, let's say your parents or your children or your spouse or people at work, maybe you're fighting with somebody. You can send your guardian angel (laughs) to speak words of consolation and, and holy pious thoughts to them. You can ask your angel to go to them. You can ask their angel to enlighten them. You know, we can use these creatures even in our human interactions Because they're praying for us. Right. Just like we pray for each other. And I think it's beautiful because not only can you, you know, send your guardian angel out to people, but also people don't realize that guardian angels, they, you can ask other people's guardian angels to be like, hey, can you help this person a little more? Because like, I don't know what they need, but you do because you're with them 24-7. Yes. And I feel like it's really sad when people don't have a relationship with their guardian angel and- I don't know, I forget where I've heard this, and maybe this is a misconception, but people have said that your guardian angel, if you're in a state of mortal sin, uh, continuously with an obscene word petence, and you know, you never try to cultivate a relationship with them, they actually leave you. Mm. Is that true? I don't think they leave you, no. Okay. They, they, they're always striving to help us to get to heaven. But if we're in a state of mortal sin, it means that we're, we don't have sanctifying grace in our soul. We're spiritually dead. Mm-hmm. They have a much harder time helping us. Right. Whereas if we're in the state of sanctifying grace, we've been to confession, we've sinned, we're receiving the sacraments of the church, we're 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 striving to be on board with God's plan for our life, yes. then our angel has a much easier job of helping us to get to the finish line. Okay. So but they don't leave us. No, their their sole task is to help us to get to that finish line. Right. And of course it's a battle for our souls. The demons want us to fail at that project. Right. right. 
So uh, you're right to point out that staying in the state of grace, going to confession, and these are all essential parts of the Catholic life, which help the angelic world to help us. Right. That's so beautiful too. And I think, especially when people start realizing like, oh, I have my own personal guardian angel and they're like, well, I can't see him or this or that. And I'm like, well, you don't have to, like, you don't mm-hmm. see God, but you have a personal relationship mm-hmm. with him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And but even there, it's through a veil, the veils and the, the, the veils of bread and wine. We don't see him as he is. Right. And we see him through the sacramental veil. And that's a part of our faith is like having faith that that is Christ. And there are some mysteries that we won't understand on this earth because God put a kind of a, a limit on our intellect so that we can't go off and be like, oh, we can see the future. And we know these, you know, we won't know that until we go to heaven. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of things that will be revealed um, if we go to heaven. And I feel like one of the difficult things for people to understand about angels is that, you know, they're depicted in so many image, you know, in pictures and stuff of having wings and having bodies, but it's like, they don't actually have that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of times people expect their guardian angel to kind of like pop out of nowhere and be like, Hey, I'm here. (laughs) And it's like, that doesn't happen. So they don't think they exist, Mm -hmm. but yet how many times has our guardian angels protected us without us even knowing it? We will see all of that when we get to heaven, please God. We'll see how many day, day after day, day in and day out, how they were protecting us and guiding us. You're right about the, about the way we depict angels. We need, you know, we're, we're, or human creatures, we need things that we can hang mm-hmm. our imagination on. And so some something that looks like a big, strong man or some kind of a, um, you know, protective, winged creature, beautiful, glorious, majestic, those are all help, help us to imagine what these creatures are. When we read the sacred scriptures, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Revelation, we get a better idea about what angels really are. Mm-hmm. They are nothing like us. They don't have bodies. Um, they, they are wild creatures in the Bible, you know, six winged figures yeah. covered or a wheel covered on all around the wheel with eyes. I mean, they're, they're almost kind of monstrous, hardly imaginable creatures. Each angel is its own species different from another as every species here on earth is different from each other. They're wildly different, practically unimaginable, but we have these, these artistic depictions, which just remind us that they exist. Right. But otherwise, we would forget about them completely. Yeah. But I think when we actually meet these creatures af- after the veils have all fallen, we will be astonished at their beauty. Yep. Um, we'll be astonished at their variety, and they will be nothing like us at all. So, you know, it's often the case that, well, they're so majestic. We have their couple scenes in the Old Testament when angels show up in people's lives, as they do throughout the old covenant. And they're like, be not afraid. And yes, it's exactly. like, why do they have to be afraid? And, or sometimes people, sometimes the, the figures of the old, old Testament want to worship them like God because mm-hmm. they see the, the majesty, the transcendent glory. And they're like, this must be God. Right. Like, no, no, no. I'm just an angel. <laughs> a little different. Don't, don't worship me. Yeah. No, no. I think it's so interesting too, because when I was a kid and like, I was reading all these books and stuff and we heard about, you know, angels coming and being like, be not afraid and stuff. I was like, oh, why would they be afraid? I mean, like, did you scare them or something? But then when you realize what they look like, you're kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> and also we know, you know, that we learned from, from the Torah, from the book of Genesis and Exodus, that man cannot look upon the face of God and live. Right. So when something so transcendent and glorious and otherworldly comes into our life, we think that we might die. Mm-hmm. It's going to overwhelm us so much. So, so incredible. Yeah. They're very powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. Especially, especially in, you know, today's world of spiritual warfare. And we mentioned a little earlier, the election coming up and then everything else we see, the evils of today. We mm-hmm. see abortion running rampant. I mean, the state, unfortunately, we're in is considered to be a oasis for abortions. And we see, um, you know, the insanity of politics, the insanity that's going within the church and stuff like that. We need you know, our heavenly family more than ever, yes. essentially the legions of angels. Yes. And especially St. Michael. So, you know, uh, St. Michael, who is the prince of the heavenly host and one of the titles we give him, uh, we, we see St. Michael show up in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, and also in the book of the apocryphal book of Enoch. Okay. We see St. Michael show up in the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, also in the letter of Jude, of St. Jude. So St. Michael shows up and what, one of the things we learn about St. Michael from the scriptural testimonies about him and his existence is that 
He was one of his jobs in the old covenant before Christ came on earth as a man. St. Michael was the protector of God's chosen people, mm -hmm. their, protect, their heavenly protector. So he was like the patron of the ancient people of God to protect them from danger, to lead them into the promised land, to uh, basically prepare them for the coming of the Messiah in Jesus Christ. Right. In the new covenant, St. Michael remains our great champion and the protector of all of Holy Church, just like he was for the for the chosen people in the old covenant. So St. Michael is especially protecting God's Holy Church in these trying and difficult times. Yeah. He's especially protecting Holy Church in the confusion, the doctrinal confusion of the church right now. As you said, in the political ambiguity and confusion of the world, St. Michael is really the one that we need to turn to to help us. Yes. In this battle, it's a battle for the salvation of the world and the battle of the salvation of souls. And I feel like who is better to do that than literally the the angel that sends Satan out of heaven, like had the battle between right. Satan. So to me, a lot of people, I feel like because St. Michael is uh, one of the more popular saints, mm -hmm. they kind of overlook his importance mm -hmm. because it becomes um, almost like they become kind of desensitized to him. And a little bit like, too, almost too familiar, yes, something like that. Yes. And people are like, oh, yeah, he's an angel. I'm like, no, like this is, he literally fought Satan, like, and does so every day. But that's why the statues of him are like stabbing Satan and, yes. of, you know, who is like God. You know, that's his name. His name is who is like God. That's and right. So like it's, it's crazy to me how people can just kind of gloss over that because they've heard about him his whole life, uh, their whole life. And it's something where I'm like, you don't read about him, like learn, you know, read about him in the Bible where he shows up and stuff. And join us in the novena. Yeah. The nine days before. Okay. So there's, so this time of the year, there's a, a couple of great ancient customs. One of them is called St. Michael's fast, which begins oh. with the feast of Our Lady's Assumption. Okay. Um, which is on August 15th and extends to September 29th. A little bit of like a Lent at the end of the summer for those who are really wanting to, to fight the spiritual battle for the protection of the church, the protection of our country in this pivotal election year, for the protection of, of the world under the warfare that we're, that we're seeing ramp up all around, we could maybe think about leading into a, a period of some kind of penitential fasting or something like that between mm -hmm. the Feast of Our Lady's Assumption and St. Michael's Day. Or if that's a little bit too much because you know that we have Advent, we have Lent, maybe people don't want to lean into a penitential practice here at this time of the year, why not a novena of prayers and learning about conferences, learning about St. Michael in the nine days leading up to his feast? And we're going to host that yeah. on, on our Abbas Circle platform and on all of our social media. So people can find about that through St. Michael's Abbey in, yeah. in Orange County, California. So in other words, since we need him so desperately, and since maybe, as you said, people um, don't appreciate his power, yeah. let's together appreciate his power this year yes absolutely and, and call on it it's and that's the thing is i feel like almost in a way like what you guys are doing is so important because it's what my generation hungers for mm. so many people from my generation they want to do the penitential fast they want to do that step because not only does it make them feel better because in a world that just tells you to go along with whatever you're feeling and just like eat the potato chips, eat the whole bag, do this, do that. Right. Death scroll tell you don't sleep. Exactly. Whereas this is like, no, like train yourself, like take a hold of your senses and make sure that your emotions aren't controlling you and you control your body. And it's so beautiful when things become rightly ordered. Um, because then you truly are able to follow Christ. Preach it, Amber. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's one of those things where I feel like there's so much going on in today's world where I'm like, this would be all fixed if like, well, also. That's right. No, absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, people can lean into serious exercise regimens, right? Yes. In the gym, at the, you know, abseiding at the table, mm -hmm. all kinds of rigorous dieting and nutrition and really serious exercising, right? Why? So that they look great. Okay, that's okay. I suppose kind of shallow, but, but, is, okay. but isn't it better to be spiritually fortified by all of that? So that kind of you're right. That same kind of discipline, which young people are starving for, mm -hmm. can be applied also to the spiritual order. You know, and when you combine those two things, even better. Yeah. You know, and that's why Exodus ninety has been such a huge hit in the last couple of years, especially with young men. Or 
why joining monasteries or communities of traditional sisters, all kinds of, you know, young people want to be heroes. Mm -hmm. They want to be saints and they don't want to do it by halves. So the monasteries and religious communities and dioceses that are really inviting people to be strong and courageous and virtuous and disciplined for God and his holy church, they're thriving. I believe it because especially these days, I mean, things were hard, like 50 years ago. Things were really hard. More than 50 years ago too. Yeah, probably throughout the entire history of the world. And I feel like this is the generation of softies and just like, no, 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 don't do that. Like it's too strenuous. Like, don't worry about that. Like just relax, play some video. Like don't do anything difficult. And I was talking with a girlfriend about this because all of her her friends have dated guys who just are soft. Mm-hmm. They, they they can't to do hard things yes. because they weren't raised to do hard things. Catholic men. Mm-hmm. And in a world that's like, oh, just be comfortable. We were not made for comfort. I forget who said that. We were not made for we're comfort. We were made for greatness. Was that Saint, Was that Pope Benedict or is that? And along with others, but I think okay. probably most recently. Yes. Okay. Because my thing was always just like people – we can look back at a hundred years and there were wars, there were crazy stuff going on, but the men were strong. They felt fulfilled because they were giving something of themselves. They were working hard for something that was greater than that. Sacrifice, Sacrifice is yes. an important part of human life. And it's especially part, an important part of masculine human life. Mm-hmm. When we embrace a spirit of sacrifice, it's because we have chosen to be responsible for our own lives and for the lives of other people. And that brings meaning to our life. Absolutely. Christ gives us the perfect example for that in his saving death upon the cross, which is the supreme sacrifice. Right. And it won salvation for the whole world in all the ways that we can imitate that in our, our own lives. Our lives will mean more and more the more we embrace the spirit of sacrifice. You're absolutely right. And it's funny how, Modernity, post-modernity with all of its comforts, creature comforts and technological advances Mm -hmm. actually inclines us toward weakness Mm -hmm. unless we're very deliberate about being disciplined and sacrificial. It's true. Yeah. And I definitely see that. I see a switch. The Mm -hmm. men who decide to like commit themselves to Christ and to do hard things are they come into themselves so much more and they're so confident. Mm -hmm. And the men And and also more attracted to women. Yes. One hundred percent. So (laughs) just (laughs) saying but the thing is is i definitely feel like if you know today we need strong men you know and strong men are men who are humble who sacrifice who are okay with doing hard things who do the fast who are okay doing penitential acts throughout the week even if it's not lens or it's not advent because i do feel like to an extent we need more of it you know it used to be so readily available to us and now we have to seek out suffering sometimes that sacrifice in some ages of human life was built into life yes you know that if if you were the firstborn son (laughs) of a farmer in medieval europe you were going to grow up farming yeah which was not an easy life is not an easy life right but it was built into the fact that this is just what life means you know, getting up at 3 a.m. to milk the cows the first time or whatever it is, right? Right. It's built in. And it's not even something that you have to choose. You, you're, you fall into it because that's what life asks of you. And these days, we have to choose to do the hard things because right now, life often asks for from us very little mm-hmm. of sacrifice. It's that's a, In a way, that's a blessing, yeah. but we can abuse it, right? Yeah, I definitely think there's that... Um, you know, Satan can really kind of warp that and and turn it into making us a society, a, you know, a generation of slope, a generation mm-hmm. of laziness and, you know, being able to do difficult things when we're called to do them. Maybe not every single day. Like you said, it's a gift too that we're not constantly put in strenuous situations, um, but seeking it out to, it, insofar as, you know, doing penance and doing these things that are so needed today. And I feel like our soul lack today are important. Um, but going back to the guardian angels and the angels in general, I've heard that they are, there are guardian angels for different states and different countries. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Okay, so there's a, uh, we get this also a scriptural idea from the book of Daniel where St. Michael is, the, as I said, the leader of God's chosen people. And we, we, we understand that there are other angels who are, 
over the Persians or that sort of nations and peoples have angelic protection and also sometimes diabolical assistance. Right. You might remember from the beginning of the book of Revelation where um, St. John, the evangelist, writes to the angel of the church of Pergamon, to the angel of church. Oh, now that's yeah. also the bishop of those places, but there's this idea that, that any time you have a group of people for some important reason, like in a nation or in a parish community or um, in a diocese, that there is a special angelic protection given to them. Now, this is not dogmatic teaching of the church. It's speculation, speculative right. theology that the, the fathers of the church and theologians think about these things by reading the scriptures and then saying, what can we elaborate from those ideas? And so the idea that there is a that there is an angel who is especially assigned to our country, an angel especially assigned maybe to a particular diocese or even parish. Um, that's where all of this comes from. That's really cool. Cause yeah, really cool. I know, especially for like families and stuff, you get a guardian angel over your family. That's your also parents. sort of the reduction, sort of the, the trickle down of that same idea about groups of people. Right. Maybe there's an angel assigned to a family. I don't know about that. I've right. read about that in the fathers, but it would make sense. Okay. Maybe maybe it's the guardian angel of the father of the family who then begins to protect the whole family in a new kind of a way. Oh, I see. It's not clear what that means if there's a special angelic protection over that family. If it's the father's guardian angel or if it's a new angel at the sign. Okay. We don't know. Yeah. But that's still like really cool because I feel like when people know that Satan exists mm -hmm. and we've kind of talked about this, people's obsession with the diabolic and with the supernatural side of things, but not always in the most healthy way. Correct. Um, which can be very detrimental to a soul because you feel like Satan's under every rock. Exactly, looking for a demon under around every corner. Like, and they are, there is a demon around every corner, but that's not how we live our life. Worry about that. Exactly. Where it's like, oh, Sally was mean to me. She must be possessed. It's like, it's it's like that's not, that's not going to work. <laughs> and so I feel like knowing the angelic side of things, knowing how angels protect us and what their role is in our lives is more beneficial almost than knowing all the stuff the demons do. Correct. And I would, I would add to that even further, Amber, what is the best thing that, what is the best thing you can do, you or any of us can do when we lean into the, the world of applying to our angels for their help? Mm -hmm. They want us to receive the sacraments. Right. They want us to be in the state of grace. They want us to participate in the sacred liturgy of God's holy church. This is what the angels want us to do because this is where we actually touch the humanity of Christ. Right. Angels are great, but they're not Jesus Christ, our savior. Where do we touch the humanity of Jesus Christ in the sacraments of the church that he established mm -hmm. and in the liturgical worship that surrounds it? So right now, yeah. all of the angels, all nine choirs of angels from the seraphim down to the lowliest guardian angel at the bottom of the angelic rank, worship God day and night in his presence that in the heavenly liturgy. The book of Revelation is filled with all the, the hymns they sang. We have sung to sung to sung to his holy, holy, holy. Yeah. We, they are praying continually in the heavenly liturgy. When you or I or any of us goes to holy mass, we are plugging into that sacred liturgy, that heavenly liturgy. We are, we, we are taking our place in it according to our rank as human beings. Our angels want to protect us from harm. They want to save us from the temptation of the devil and his minions. But they want us to receive the sacraments and to pray with them at the liturgy of God's holy church. That's what they want. Right. It always has to come back to that. So where people are too interested in a kind of curious way about demons and exorcism and all of that world, it doesn't necessarily bring them to the sacraments and the sacred liturgy. Right. That's the whole view. Absolutely. Especially when you know, people get so wrapped up in the diabolic that it can actually harm their faith more so than help their faith. Yeah, they're full of fear or they feel worried or they're not looking for the concrete means of grace, like exactly. a good holy confession or the reception of holy communion. Because confession can sometimes be more beneficial than an exorcism. It's always more beneficial than an exorcism. Oh. Uh, confession, the, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, penance, that's a sacrament. Yeah. Direct contact with the humanity of Christ direct communication of sanctifying grace and increase in sanctifying grace. The exorcism ritual is what we call a sacramental, like wearing a staff healer, like blessing yourself with holy water. Mm -hmm. it's, a sac it's only a sacramental. Confession is a sacrament, far more powerful. 
I feel like the distinguish, like nobody ever distinguishes that because everyone thinks of exorcisms as being more. Because they're interesting and salacious and unusual. And probably because of Hollywood too. Exactly. <laughs> Hollywood likes to kind of over-exaggerate things. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And when it comes to, you know, guardian angels knowing that they can protect us from the demonic, I feel like, you know, we need to be a generation of hope, not a generation of fear. fear. Yes. Fear is not of God. Fear is of the devil, because if the devil can scare you, if he can make you paranoid, you're controlled. St. John in his first epistle said beautifully, love casts out fear mm -hmm. and yeah. perfect love casts out all fear. Yep. Love casts out fear. We're people who want to love our Lord more and more. Yes. Not be afraid of dangers around us. Exactly. And I think we have this issue today as Catholics. We're afraid. We're afraid of being public with our faith. We're afraid of doing the sign of the cross in public by our friends. Like, this never used to be an issue. Wear it by the end, you know? <laughs> yeah, I got Wear it. Wear it. cross here. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like a lot of the times Catholics are really scared to have these conversation starters. That's why they hide on social media so much. And, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I'm not. But I definitely think that we are a generation of not a generation of fear, but like the Catholics this time around are, there are a lot of really brave ones that yeah. are out there doing rosary rallies. They're very public, mainly in like Poland and, and areas. But I feel like the other generation kind of hides online and they don't do more than just putting something online and hoping it takes off and people see it. Right. And what would you say for people who are afraid of sharing their faiths and, and just in general are kind of afraid to be Catholic public? I, I would say I would encourage people start with what seems like kind of the ordinary, maybe even sort of boring, beautiful, terrible daily duty of the Catholic life. Go to Mass regularly. If you can go to Mass every day, go to Mass every day. And you think, well, Father, that's not, pu that's not public. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is public. It's the public worship of God in His church. If you go to Mass, more than just, first of all, go to Mass on Sunday because yes. that's the beginning, right? Go to Mass on Sunday and Holy Days. Do that. And then go to Mass more. Say the rosary every single day. If you do that, and that's ordinary daily discipline like mm -hmm. we were talking about before, it will give you the strength you need to have the courage to say out loud the truth when you're confronted in, at work or with your friends or at school because you will be fortified by the word of God, by the sacraments of the church. You'll be ready because you're going to be, you, you will have already engaged in the, in the struggle of getting up every day and being a Catholic. Right. And then when it becomes real in public, that is saying grace before meals in a restaurant or wearing a crucifix around your neck or whatever, or joining a religious order, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll have the strength to do that because you will have been practicing it every day. Right. You know, I think that, the social media world and the internet world online makes us think that life has to be really exciting and glamorous and perfect. But in fact, life is about loving the people in your family, mm -hmm. the people right around you, doing the, the simple but daily things of the Catholic life. Right. And then you'll have the courage. Okay. Then you'll have the courage to be public about it because you will have been practicing day in and day out. Does that make sense? Yes, 100%. And we're completely, it's in the same way that, you know, some of these, well, I can't start that. Just like, I'm not going to go to the gym because I never look like that guy. Right. Well, no, that's all he does. <laughs> he works out six or eight hours a day so he can be on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Or she is, she looks like that because that's all she thinks about in a selfish and glorious being, being, being way, right? Mm -hmm. And she's the one that you see on your, on your social media yeah. or he's the one you see on your social media. Well, that's not real life, my friends. It's just, not yeah it's shallow and hollow and most exactly. of those people are depressed right real life is you have a husband or a wife or children or parents mm -hmm. or people at work and god wants you to that's where jesus christ is coming to meet you right and where you where you become jesus christ for those people right you know, yeah it doesn't have to be glamorous and i think a lot of times and that's something i always put on my channel is i'm like this is about real life not all of my blogs are going to be aesthetically pleasing <laughs> There are going to be scenes where my hair is like, you could probably fry some French fries in it. And I think people are really falling in love with the normalcy on social media where people are like, this is just my normal life. I don't have the latest Instagram stuff. I don't have 
Amazon clothes piled up in my closet. I make a regular pot of coffee in the morning yes. and I don't have to like sew on a special cappuccino top, you know, exactly. that, like just, like, just, just regular coffee. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, people life can be ordinary. People love, I feel like people are really lo- falling back in love with simplicity. And that's why minimalism is such a thing nowadays, but they're missing the core of it, which is Christ, which is living in poverty in a way that also sanctifies us instead of just being like, I'm going to sleep on a floor on a rug. And that's the only furniture I have in my house because I lived in a hoarding house for 25 years. It's like, instead of that, it's like God needs to be at the center of everything we do. That's why I feel like the trends today are so empty because they have intermittent fasting, but we have real fast. Mm -hmm. They have meditation, but we have the rosary. Yes. They have the, the minimalism and whatever. And we have poverty. One is fulfilling. Evangelical simplicity. Yes. Yeah. And one is fulfilling and it feeds your soul. And the other one is hollow and empty. Then one is fulfilling and feeds your soul because it's rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ. Ah. The other is shallow and unfulfilling because it's all about this world mm-hmm. and its illusions and supplements, right? Yeah. You mentioned the rosary, the, you know, a path forward in gospel simplicity mm-hmm. and the ordinariness of life is saying the rosary every day. It, needs it changed you. It's it's it will change your life. I promise. I think that's one of the number one things Our Lady has always said in her apparition. Every single time. Pray the Rosary, Akita, Fatima, every Lord. Yes, Lord. yes, that's right. Pray the Rosary and pray for for, for for sinners. Pray for the conversion of poor sinners. Yeah. Right? That sin is real, and we want to avoid it. And we want, along with our blessed Lord, we want all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We want everybody on the face of the earth to be saved. That means we have to preach the gospel and we have to live the gospel and we have to proclaim the beautiful, joyful fact of being a Roman Catholic Christian, right. which is the fullness of the truth. Absolutely. And I always think of St. Jacinta who would spend hours on her knees doing the Oh My Jesus prayer because mm-hmm. Our Lady told her like so many people go to hell and she showed the kids hell and it horrified them. And so many saints have had the ability to have a vision of how through God, you know, allowing that. And every single time it just is like, people go here. It's real. It changed their lives when they yes. realized that. So again, we can take that truth, the reality of sin, the dangers of eternal perdition, and we couple that with the beautiful hope mm-hmm. of the angelic order, the powerful protection of St. Michael, and all of the benefits we get through the sacramental life of the church. And we have a recipe for victory yes. there, right? Victory, salvation, and the transformation of the world. Absolutely. Right? And I feel like one of the main things, at least with my generation, is we constantly feel like we have to take on the world. But in reality, like we have to convert the world. We have to take back the Holy Land. Like, And it's like, no, it starts with you. It starts with you, like you said, just going to Mass, living an ordinary life, helping the people around you. Especially that, especially that that it's it's great to think about the big the big huge global kind of victory yes but in a way the harder one is loving my mother or sister or brother or father from whom i'm estranged right or loving that person at work or at school who is really really hard for me to get along with yeah right that's where the rubber meets the road that's the victory actually that christ wants you or me to win Mm -hmm. that victory because that's a cosmic struggle in my life in the here and now. Right. It's I can escape that by thinking I'm going to reconquer the Holy Land. Yeah. <laughs> but that means I can ignore that brother in my monastery that's difficult for me to love. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. I mean, basically, I'm basically escaping the real place where God is inviting me to engage in the battle by imagining it somewhere else, bigger, more glorious. Right. And he wants me to love that person concretely today. And it has a ripple effect. Heck yeah. And I think that's something people don't realize. And time and time again, the saints have shown us that sometimes the fruits of what you do will not be seen in your lifetime, but later. St. Francis of Rome, this wonderful little known, she was a married woman who then, I, I think she was a married woman who then spent the rest of her life taking care of the poor after in her widowhood. I think something like that. I might be getting some mystery wrong, but one one part that comes from her life that we read about every year in the Liturgy of the Hours, where she would go and collect the rags from the poor people on the street in Rome and kind of fix them, their rags, their their the little clothing they had. She would sort of mend them and clean them and then give them back to them oh. in a completely hidden way. 
like no one knew that yeah. she was basically helping the guy, the hobo on the street corner to be a little bit more dignified. Right. Completely hidden. Completely hidden. Mm. And sanctified. Beautiful. And I feel like it's it's kind of a reflection of Jesus' hidden light too. It's like yeah. you're hidden, yes. you're hidden in his life in a way. And like you said, when um, we can see Christ in everybody. And so when you go to even the poorest person, it's like Christ is in them. And I think that's really important in today's day and age where the homeless are kind of just walk past. And obviously there's some safety issues there, but. Yes. I mean, I had to think about that and how we take care of for those people who are the visible poor among us. Yes. But also back to the kind of concrete here now in people's ordinary lives. What about that person whom you despise at work because you just can't stand their personality and they're poor yeah. and you can supply for their poverty by smiling at them or loving them. Maybe no one has smiled at them for two weeks. Right. And you're supplying, you're, you're giving to them in their need. Mm -hmm. You yeah. should also take care of the indigent poor on the street. That's a really good thing if you're all to do that. It reminds me of St. Tress of Lisieux, who was like, I really don't like this other nun sister, but she literally, the other sister had no idea because St. Tress treated her so well that she was like, why does she, why does she just like that? Yes. It's really crazy. I often think about that sister who undoubtedly read mm -hmm. St. Yeah. Tress' the autobiography after it was, it became common knowledge in the convent. And she thought, wow. You know, in a way that's sort of humiliating and horrifying for her to read that she was the object of mm -hmm. Therese's special charity precisely because, see, Therese didn't like her. Right. And I think what a horrible humiliation and opportunity for con for conversion in that sister's life too. You right. know, and that's sort of horrifying, isn't it? Yes. To read about that. And know that like, everybody... what? But as you think, wow, okay. So I too am in need of the love of God in this privileged kind of a way. Where right. each of us is. Yeah. But none of us is the perfect Christian, right? No, we all have a way of kind of pushing each other's buttons in different ways. And I mean, especially just in everyday life when you're around people, you really do kind of lose sight of Christ in them and the dignity they have as a child of God. Oh, yes. And I think that that's something, you know, is also important. It's like going back to the angels thing and the guardian angels, like asking their guardian angel, like, hey, help them. Like we mentioned that. Or help and, me to love them. Yes, yes, 100%. Show me, you know, I feel like guardian angels are really good at revealing things to us as well that we might be blind to if we ask them. Yes. I asked my guardian angel what one of my defects was, along with Our Lady of uh, Our Lady Endure. Not. And, um, did, did, did they reveal that to you? Were yeah. you humiliating? I was just like, oh, no. I was just like, really? <laughs> I was like, but you asked. Yeah. And the thing is, it's so funny because we don't realize what we ask for. You know, you pray the litany of humility, the litany of trust. You read, you know, uh, prayer books or something and you're like, God, if it's not from you, take it away. You know, but it is from you. Like, let your will be done. And then he's just like, okay. And you're like, <laughs> what, the, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> and so it's like, we have to be careful what we ask for, but also understand that it will help our sanctification. Absolutely. And I say, let's not be careful what Let's ask for great things. Ask to be a great saint. A great saint. Ask to be a martyr. Ask to be an evangelist. Mm -hmm. Ask to be an apostle. Ask to be a prophet. Ask for the gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. Ask for great things. Yeah. Why not? What are we here for? Mm -hmm. This world is our ship, not our home. So, like, mm -hmm. it's temporary. But yeah, I think our time is almost up here. Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Father Ambrose, for coming on here. Um, and once again, where can my followers find St. Michael's Abbey and okay. St. Michael? Uh, you guys are doing all that. Okay. So stmichaelsabbey.com is our website. The abbotcircle.com is a special virtual monastery with a lot of programming, beautiful, all kinds of great content that's there. You can find that. That's the abbotcircle.com, kind of a virtual monastic experience. Instagram, St. Michael's Abbey, yep. YouTube, St. Michael's Abbey. There are probably other places, you know, for the, if there's anybody of that older generation, Facebook is probably still active, I don't know. Okay. It, we'll see. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we'll, we'll put, I think, links in all of those, right? Yeah. Description. Yes, they will all be in the description for everyone to find. So. Come and join us, and especially join us for the Novena to St. Michael. Yes, that's going to be so amazing, and people definitely, especially today, we talked about that, so... 100%. Um, but no, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for God coming God bless you, Amber. On. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And let's do it again sometime. Yes, absolutely. And with all that being said, guys, if you enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.